Good afternoon, everyone, and a special welcome to the foreign guests in um, still Europe, our friends in the United Kingdom. Um, good evening to all uh, attending from Asia, and good morning to everyone attending from the Americas. Um, a warm welcome to all the speakers and um, our fellow um, organizing partners, AAPH, uh, Tim Briarcliffe, who will be moderating this session today. Um, is joining us live from Oxfordshire, uh, the UK, Floriculture International, important media partner, and the session is brought to you live from the World Authority Center here in the Netherlands. And we produce this as a series of events that address relevant and current topics that help improve the business of our partners. World Authority Center is a private initiative. Um, over 130 companies are partner here and they have one common goal actually and that is collaboration as you perhaps just noticed in the commercial uh, preceding the opening um a prominent dutchman in, in floriculture mr jaap van dijn founder of um, the dutch flower group um explained his passion for collaboration and he made the point that businesses by themselves and also individuals are never 100 percent complete um but if you collaborate um, even with opponents sometimes um it fills the voids and it makes the picture complete kind of a philosophical uh entree um i suppose but nevertheless there is a important uh truth in that and also an analogy to today's uh, topic um, but those speakers following me will um, hopefully address for them. Um, today's session, obviously, I should make a small disclaimer in this context, is about the Brexit topic. And um, I'm sure that many of you who joined us now today um, are facing uncertain times and might have a lot of questions. Um, what we present you today with is personal views personal expertise from each individual speakers to the best of their knowledge from their own standpoint and backgrounds um, organizations uh, that that have to um, as a prime role actually um, try to figure out um, structure and facts in the chaos that has um, become to surround the brexit um, um, negotiations um, but it is in difficult times as these that the collaboration um, can uh, shed a light on um, on questions that individuals may have. So, hence the disclaimer is: please consider the content given to the best of our capacity and knowledge. Um, no legal consequences, uh, hopefully, will uh, will follow. And following this session on the website of world hockey center and also with links from aph and floriculture international obviously we will kind of keep a track on the, the q and a's um and we've seen in the first session on october 29th about this topic um huge traffic in um, um in, in direct questions so if you have individual questions that cannot be asked in the in the plenary group in the chat function don't hesitate to email us contact us um otherwise just use the chat function i see uh, a lot of um, activity going on there um we have moderators on site and also we can count on external expertise from the dutch ministry um agriculture and fisheries um they have a brexit team standby to uh, help address questions you might have um for now long introduction i would like to introduce you to your moderator today mr tim briarcliffe Secretary General of AAPH, and he is uh, joining us uh, live from the UK. We'll be moderating the session. So, uh, Tim, best of luck, and uh, over to you. Well, good afternoon and uh, good morning, wherever you are in the world. It really is uh, great to see you uh, to what well, not to see you but at least to know that you are here listening in for uh, this uh, webinar today on brexit thank you very much you for your introduction um and uh, it's my pleasure today to be able to moderate this uh, event 
albeit from my home rather than in the lovely facility in the World Horty Centre. Uh, thank you very much for you and to the World Horty Centre for all of you for the uh, preparations and work you have done to enable us to uh, put on this webinar today. Um, yes, my name is Tim Brycliffe. I am the Secretary General of AIPH, which is the International Association of Horticulture Producers. We're also the publisher of Floriculture International Magazine, FCI, and uh, together we are bringing uh, this event to you uh, today as well. Um, as a little bit of background for you and uh, AIPH, we are the world's champion for the power of plants. And we have our members are associations that represent the interests of growers and producers in of ornamental plants and flowers uh, in different countries around the world. We have a number of different initiatives that we run for uh, the industry. Um, we uh, produce annual statistical information, including a statistical yearbook that we produce along with our colleagues in Union Fleur. We run the uh, International Grower of the Year Awards competition. We uh, run Green City initiatives. We approve international horticultural exhibitions uh, and we do work supporting growers and topics such as novelty protection, sustainability, plant health and so on. Uh, so it really is a, a pleasure to be able to uh, welcome you all today to this webinar. Uh, I need to point out to you that um, the webinar will be recorded and it will be sent to you afterwards with presentations as well so you can see those at the end of this uh, session we're going to have each speaker is going to go one after the other uh, i will introduce each one um, and then at the end we will have a panel session where we can have some questions so if you have questions that come up in the talks please put them down preferably in english and then I can read them, and then we can share them with the panelists later on. Well, uh, we try to get through as many of them as we can. Uh, so yes, please stay for the panel session. Please also, I remind the presenters to please stay for the panel session at the end. It would not be the same without them. So please uh, stay around for that. And, uh, and I'd also like to thank for this one, the support of the Horticultural Trades Association, uh, for their support for this event uh, from the UK as well. Uh, just a reminder, if you don't know, they were doing another webinar on Friday, which is focused on the cut flower sector. This one is focused on the plants, trees, bulb sector. So let's uh, get started. Now, Brexit is something which provokes very strong opinions and views. It does here in the UK, and I know it does across Europe and around the world. And today we're not going to go over all of those kind of arguments. We are where we are and we have to deal with what is coming in the next few weeks and into 2021. We're going to look at what Brexit is going to mean for this sector, what the industry needs to do to be able to manage the changes which are going to come about for that. And of course, there are many points that we have to consider, things that we don't even know yet still what are going to happen. First of all, is there even going to be a deal or is it going to be no deal? What are the kind of customs bureaucracy which may be required? What about the phytosanitary requirements and plant health issues? What about tariffs which may come? What about delays which may be experienced in trade and the costs associated with them? What about uh, product in and out of Northern Ireland? What about exchange rates? All of these kind of things. We may not answer all of your questions today, but I hope that we can certainly uh, get a better insight and a better understanding together so we can find a way to make this industry work uh, smoothly still through these uh, difficult waters which we are going to face as we enter into 2021. Thankfully, it is not my job to be able to give you all the answers and all the explanations, but we are joined today by a great team of presenters, and uh, they are going to help us in understanding what goes on. So we're going to start off with Sally Cullimore from HTA. We'll go on to Eileen Vandenberg from Rabobank. 
we will have Stefan Kuman from uh, Rabobank. Sorry, Eileen van der Berg was from Royal Flora Holland, not Rabobank. And then we will have Bruce Harnett from Kernock Park Plants in the UK and Hank Westerhoff from Anthos in the Netherlands. So we've got a lot of content to get through. I ask the speakers, please, to keep the, to the time uh, schedule. Uh, but without any more delay, um, I'm uh, going to introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is Sally Cullimore. Sally is policy manager for the Horticultural Trades Association in the UK. Uh, she's going to look at the Brexit challenges uh, for plant tree bulb importers and exporters and how the UK production and the UK retail industry is preparing for Brexit. Sally has worked in the ornamental horticulture industry for many years and she for producers and three years ago she joined HTA as its policy manager. Sally's work involves raising the profile of the horticulture industry to government uh, and is focusing on EU exit policy and uh, and this is certainly the focus, not surprisingly, of her work at the moment. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm pleased to pass over to Sally now. Welcome, Sally. Thanks, Tim. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and um, welcome to everybody. Like Tim says, my name is Sally Cullimore and I'm the policy manager here at the HTA. Um, so the Horticultural Trades Association represents the whole ornamental supply chain across the UK. So within our membership, we have garden centres, growers, landscapers and garden goods manufacturers. So there's a whole lot uh, going on at the moment with EU exit. Um, and part of my remit is to highlight the difficulties and discuss issues and work on solutions with the UK government on EU exit matters, which affect our members. So I'm just going to share my screen now because I have a presentation for you. Um, I'm hoping it's there. OK. So 2020, well, it's been a spectacularly different year for many reasons, and not least because industry and governments in both the EU and the UK have arrived maybe late getting down to the detail when it comes down to understanding how the plant trade between the UK and the EU will actually work. Obviously, of intense interest to us all attending this webinar um, is how plants and plant products will move between the EU and the UK after the 1st of January. So I was hoping to be able to say something about a deal at this point, um, and I have sounded like a broken record for the last three months, but it has to be said, we still await results of negotiations and the detail isn't even clear yet. But we are inching closer to clarity with only 20 working days left until everything changes. The HTA currently is highlighting to political figures in the UK government that their rhetoric of free trade and a global Britain is being undermined by this desire to gold plate the current plant health regulations, while at the same time setting up our own plant health regime. We believe at HTA that it's about getting the balance right between biosecurity of the UK and allowing the smooth flow of trade through the traditional trading routes, which need to be maintained while reinforcing the message that the biosecurity of the UK is high up on everyone's agenda. I mean, no one wants to be the one to bring in that pest or that disease that will affect subsequent trade or even devastate the natural environment of the UK's green and pleasant land. As I'm sure we, well, I'm not sure, but maybe you, you are aware that actually the first version of the border operating model published by the Cabinet Office's agency, the Border Protocol and Delivery Group, actually had plants for planting listed as high risk plants. And this was alongside controlled goods, which uh, included guns, ammunition, torture devices, explosives and weapons of mass destruction. And at the time, you didn't know whether to laugh or despair. And at that stage, plants would be controlled from day one in a proposed three stage process, 
while other sectors would get more time to prepare. Cut flowers and fresh produce, for example, have until 1st of April before they are required to travel with a fire sanitary certificate and make pre-notification. And general goods have until the 1st of July, when everything will then be expected to make customs declarations in advance and travel through a BCP, which is a border control post. The first bond to find those high risk plants as all those that were included in the EU plant health regulations. So plants were planting because they were included in the EU plant passport regime. They would come under that banner. It's also stated that all of these high risk plants, as well as being pre notified and requiring a phytosanitary or a PC, would also have to be inspected at a border control post from day one. So. After initial discussions with the industry, the government decided to relent on these actions. So by the time the second edition of the bomb was published in October, those high risk plants were redesignated high priority plants. And the requirement for inspections and checks to take place at BCPs had been replaced with the requirement for place of destination inspections. Based on an as yet to be disclosed frequency of checks dictated by pre notifying imports on a new IT system called IPAFS. This system was to be launched this November for plants and plant products, but these processes and still these processes are, will be required from day one in the second version, and the existing three stage approach would stand as per the first border operating model. But <laughs> IPAFS and its sister system for exports from GB, ECHO, will now not be ready for the 1st of January. They will probably be online sometime in February. Um, they're still subject to development and they do have some issues to overcome before being fit for purpose. So in the meantime, all companies wishing to import plants into Great Britain, so everybody who is located within Great Britain and wishes to import plants, will need to pre-notify consignments on the existing peach system. And exports will be lodged also on an existing system, the Domero. Neither of these legacy systems are designed for the expected volume of trade as we progress through the season in 2021. So before I go on to describe a little bit of the detail and summarise where we are and what is yet to be done, I just want to be clear that I am presenting this from a, a GB business point of view. And also just to point, and Tim touched on it earlier, the HTA also don't represent the cut flower trade, so I can't make comments on that side of things. So this document, this process map, which is relatively complicated and represents the period January to July for plant imports. Um, it identifies where there are expected costs. So everything with a red square around it, um, where a red highlight shows that that's where costs are expected to be incurred, whether they might be invoice costs or administrative costs, staff costs or combination of that. What this model doesn't even show is the interaction with the UK plant passport system, which will be introduced from the 1st of January. So that cost has to be factored in too. So on this slide, we'll talk only about plant import notifications into GB. This process is January to the 1st of July only, and it's designed to show that it is still rather complicated and there are areas still requiring clarification. It's also worth noting that in GB, plant import inspection fees are suspended until the 1st of April. And that includes the fees for the phytosanitary documentation check, which applies to all consignments. So firstly, registration is required on the IT system. I've left it as IPASS because that will be the long term system going forward. Uh, like I said, peach for January, IPASS when it's ready. This is in order to send a pre-notification of a plant consignment's arrival into GB. Um, we do note that DEFRA have said IPAS and PEACH training will be available, but we, this isn't apparent yet. I believe they do have some webinars upcoming. And like I've said, there are a few issues already coming to light regarding the IPAS system. 
and we have said to DEFRA um, that they should not introduce IPATHs until it is absolutely ready and it must enable a smooth upload of data for businesses and it should be easy to understand and utilise. So each premises that will be receiving a direct plant delivery from the EU must register as a place of destination with the GB Plant Health Authority. This is so they can receive import inspections on consignments and every peach IPATH's pre-notification must then nominate a place of delivery where the inspection takes place. So once the process moves to BCPs in July, those pods will not be required, pod being a place of destination. And import inspections then become the responsibility of the carrier arriving at the BCP. There is a two-step process to conducting your pre-notification. So firstly, a copy of the phytosanitary certificate is received in electronic form from the EU-based supplier. The EU-based supplier must arrange that with EU-based plant health inspectors. That PC is uploaded and it's attached to that pre-notification by the importer. The pre-notification is basically a list of every plant species that is being imported on that delivery under that phytosanitary certificate to that place of destination. And when you make that pre-notification, you will get an automatic flag that will be received by those pre-notifying that an inspection is to be made at the pod. So pre-notification must be made four hours before the consignment reaches the uh, border of the GB. Um, and it, that is if transported by air or on a roll on roll off ferry or via Eurotunnel, everywhere else is subject to 24 hours notice of arrival. So HTA working really hard with DEFRA to see if we can get released a list of species they're targeting for inspection, along with an expected frequency of inspection. So we do expect that to be a minimum of 10% import inspections, but we do know that those frequencies are expected to increase depending on what species you're bringing in. So we can certainly expect to see Xylella high-risk hosts high up on AFA's target list, AFA being the animal and plant health agency that is responsible for making the inspections GB. The pre-notifier then sets the time that the plants will be available for the inspector. This will be um, within inspector's working hours. We still don't have a firm agreement on that, but we expect it to be at least 60 days a week and basic off office hours. Um, the time can actually be amended on the pre-notification system. So if anything untoward happens, such as a lorry is delayed, the ferry is delayed, um, it can be amended right up to the stated time of arrival. The inspection then takes place within a four hour window at the time set on the system. Also, if the inspector can't make it or doesn't turn up for some reason, then those plants on that consignment are then automatically released. So if there's what, more than one place of destination on one delivery lorry, they can all travel under one phytosanitary certificate. That is if all those place of destinations are under one company. So, for example, there's one customer with multi-drop deliveries on one truck. That's one phytosanitary certificate. What we're working on now, with so little time left, is to see if one truck can travel under one phytosanitary certificate, but to different premises of different companies. This will certainly save on the EU side inspection costs um, and EU side time and pre-notification purposes. So. Now we move on to what it looks like come July. So we've bypassed the April stage two, where cut flowers and fresh produce are subject to the same requirements as plant for planting, plants for planting. And we arrive at the 1st of July, which is basically the final stage. So this is when everything must have both a customs declaration and arrive at a border control post when entering Great Britain. So, Lots more process to go through at the border and the potential for delay is very high, but there are similar costs involved. So also, once the GB business receives the goods, um, they are cleared and there's no further requirements to be done. 
So what is, what is HTA actually working on with the UK government? For those that don't know, DEFRA is the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, um, which is basically um, the, the department that we uh, communicate most with. These are the guys that actually set the import export strategy for plants and plant products. So border control posts. So once BCPs come online on the 1st of July, it's really important that they have the right facilities to unload trucks selected for plant health inspections. Um, it has to be said, much of the infrastructure required still has not been built or set up. We are assured that BCPs will have the same facilities as current BCPs, which are equipped to receive imports, but they certainly should have sheltered areas, uh, temperature controlled facilities, skilled staff available to unload and reload packed trucks properly, and sufficient capacity, sufficient capacity to cope with the hundreds of thousands, likely millions, of plant and plant product consignments and that includes fresh produce and plants and cut flowers that arrive from the EU every year. And lastly, we uh, want to ensure that BCPs are manned 24-7 for inspection purposes. There's also an important question around liability for product damaged when unloaded and reloaded for inspection. There is also the possibility of premises being licensed or audited to be either an enhanced place of destination or like a mini BCP. Um, it's certainly one of the solutions on relieving the expected pressure at border control posts and ensuring product is unloaded correctly by skilled personnel. Um, and it would allow those businesses that wish to, to be an enhanced pod or a mini BCP to be part of a trusted trader scheme, and hopefully that will aid trade flow through to final destinations. Lastly, we've also mooted the possibility of AFRA inspectors being permanently based in EU locations, something that does currently have precedent, I believe. And this could aid yes. the pre-inspection of some loads ready to make their journey, and again, aid the flow of live product through the border without stopping. All right, Sally, can you just try to conclude quite soon, if that's OK? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I know a number of EU side businesses are offering GB customers the option that they will act as UK importers as well as EU exporters, employing UK based agents as third parties. So just covering a few potential items that might need to be addressed after the first. Uh, forward planning for costs. It's really important that itemising areas where costs are passed on will help enormously when evaluating the costs subsequently of EU exit. And please do decide how to communicate an import inspection to customers in GB. Be clear about who's receiving the inspection flag from the notification system. And communication is key all around. They need to be clear and transparent who's responsible for which costs, which actions, and also where liability lies if there's an issue. And as soon as you're able, do a test run for the expected processes. And do allow your customers and suppliers to explore options. Some may have found their own customs agents, for example, who will be able to communicate with your own agents. So don't just accept the first solution that comes along. And it's all changed 1st of July. So we have explained what we are working on for post-July. And there's definitely scope G GB side for locations to become mini P BCPs. So in conclusion, there's a lot to do in just the 20 days left. There will be hiccups and bumps. So let's hope that a pragmatic approach is taken at both sides of the border, both with officials and also with businesses. And for the future, there are lots of areas where we can uh, streamline trade flow. For, so, for example, e-phytos, e-plant passports, APNR at borders, just to name a few. And it is important that the EU grants third country equivalents ASAP to GB, in particular for the prohibited high risk plants list. So they, these are ACEs, Quercus, Malus. That it is an issue. And the, the UK has actually exempted the EU from the prohibit, this prohibition list um, as allowing imports. There is political will. If there is political will, then things can move forward in an easier man manner. And we are continuing current calls to UK government to get import inspections suspended until July, as we feel the POD system is fraught with difficulties and it's just too little too late. 
IT systems are not going to be ready and pre-notification is going to be onerous, costly and difficult. Uh, and until negotiations are concluded and Northern Ireland is sorted, that side of things remains a, a, a ridiculous system with Northern Ireland where phytosanitaries are required for sending plants in, in, in product from GB to Northern Ireland. And lastly, I can just say good luck to everyone, because despite all the planning and collaboration, there will be issues. But together, I'm really positive that, that as a collaborative and communicative industry, we can surmount them together. Well, Sally, thank you very much for that. That was a very uh, helpful uh, review of uh, where we are at at the moment and what needs to happen. And as well as your political activity, which I know is very much appreciated uh, within the industry in the UK and I'm sure across now in other countries as well as you're fighting all for the industry across those areas. So thank you and I look forward to seeing you in the panel with us a little bit later on. Uh, now we're going to go on to our next speaker is Eileen Vandenberg, who's Supply Chain and Public Affairs at uh, Royal Flora Holland in the Netherlands. Uh, Eline is a program manager of the Holland Flower Alliance, but today she's going to talk to us about the impact of Brexit on the market position of the Netherlands. So welcome, Eline. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tim. And uh, I would like to say uh, uh, goodbye from the Netherlands, uh, from the World Horty Center. And during my presentation, I would like to present the impact analysis we've done within Flora Holland. Um, like Tim mentioned, I'm working at the uh, Public Affairs Department at uh, Royal Flora Holland. And uh, we have a task force within Flora Holland uh, for the Brexit. And uh, within this task force, we have uh, um, uh, done an impact analysis, which I would like to present to you. Um, yeah, and then, of course, the obvious question, why an impact analysis? Um, because the United Kingdom is a very important export market for, uh, for the Netherlands, actually the second export market. Um, the value of the Dutch flower export is uh, 855 million euros in 2019. Um, and what we noticed, and of course this is obvious, that a lot of attention this year went to the COVID situation, first in the beginning of this year, because in the, in the first wave, now we're in the middle of the second wave with, again, lockdown measures uh, in different countries uh, with consequences to the flower trade. Um, but we also realized, uh, especially when we started uh, preparing this analysis, that there was little focus on Brexit yet. Although, yeah, like Sally explained already and everybody knows, it's getting really uh, close now. Um, so, yeah, and everybody was talking about, yeah, we expect there will be more costs involved, there will be more time needed for preparation. So we really wanted to have more insight uh, in this course in this time. And, yeah, as a result in the economic impact on the export for flowers and plants to the UK. A disclaimer. Uh, like everybody knows, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties because the ne negotiations are still uh, going on. And secondly, in our calculation, we have calculated with estimate figures. So if you have done research for yourself or made a calculation for your uh, own situation as well, uh, of course, then the impact might vary a little bit. Um, to explain about the approach of our analysis, we used four building blocks, uh, commercial, operational, phytosanitary, and financial. And I, I will um, yeah, uh, explain uh, every building block one by one to you and the impact. So first commercial, then first it's important to stress um, that if we talk about the export of flowers and plants to the UK, that almost 75% consists of cut flowers and 27% plants. And that's important to know because the expected input duty um, for cut flowers is 8% and for plants, which is more relevant for this webinar, is uh, estimated of is expected 0%. If we look at the total impact, so uh, cut flowers and plants together, then the total impact on the export uh, turnover will be approximately 5.8%. Uh, 
on the non-EU cut flowers, like flowers from Kenya, Ethiopia, Africa, or South America, the import duty will remain 0%. So that will be an important change uh, between EU cut flowers and non-EU cut flowers. When we talk about the commercial impact, it's also really good to, uh, to, to realize that the preparation of the export documents requires much more strict uh, order process. That really will be a change compared to the actual situation because yeah, uh, you need to have a, uh, the, the shipment ready to prepare the documents. So instead of uh, the current situation, it's not possible then anymore to make some last minute changes uh, in the shipment. And that of course will uh, have impact also in the relationship between uh, a grower and an exporter, for instance. Um, concluding, the commercial impact on the export value based on the import duty, what we expect will be 5.8%. Then looking to the operational impact, um, yeah, what you will see is that there are uh, extra customs uh, formalities involved. And we based our impact analysis on some uh, information from uh, the KPMG uh, report, which has been done in 2018. And they have mentioned that approximately the custom formality cost will uh, lie between 78 euro per shipment and 126 euro per shipment. So we calculated with the 78 euro because that seems to be uh, uh, close to what, what was going to happen. And in relation to the export turnover, the impact will be approximately 0.2%. What is very important to realize, because we realized also that in the KPMG report, there is a bit little at more, uh, less attention also to the return flow. So the return shipments of uh, RTIs, the transport items like the trolleys. Uh, so that's also good for you to, to realize that you need to export them from the UK and import them again to the U, uh, EU. And that there, again, there are custom formalities and costs involved. Um, of course, when you don't have any experience as an exporter with uh, exporting in general, then uh, it's, yeah, you have a choice whether you're going to organize this all within your own company or that you're going to outsource these activities to an expeditor and if you choose for the second part there of course there are for these services extra costs involved when we come to the time aspect uh, how many time will be uh, necessary to do the preparation then uh, we expect that for an exporter um, the expected time needed will be at least four extra hours till 24 hours why this difference? Uh, like Sally mentioned already, there uh, the pre-notification of a shipment in the UK needs to be done four hours in advance. But we've also heard some exporters saying that they um, they they think they uh, or they are preparing their process with an extra day in between because they say we need an extra day to do all the pre uh, uh, preparation to. Um, apply for the uh, inspection, the phytosanitary inspection. So that's one day extra in the process and one day extra keeping products in stock means that you have additional inventory costs like interest, space, um, and probably also some loss of product. Um, then the transporter, yeah, we all expect especially in the beginning, there will be waiting times at the border, but hopefully as, as little as possible. Um, so there might be extra time as well in the process. And we heard also uh, some transporting companies already uh, um, yeah, uh, announcing that they will charge an extra Brexit surcharge. Um, this concluded, we uh, expect that on the operational side, the impact will be approximately uh, 5% plus the 0.2% for operational. Then the phytosanitary uh, impact. Um, yeah, what we would like to warn for is there probably might from uh, next year on an import restriction on high risk products like uh, xylella, host plants and citrus. 
And why is that? Because the UK announced already an import restriction this year, but later on they had to withdraw, withdraw the uh, restriction because they were still part of the European Union and couldn't decide it just by themselves. But please note that that might be uh, yeah, introduced next year again. Then um, the implementation of the customs formalities um, in the three phases model. So the, from the 1st of January on, there will be inspection uh, uh, needed for high priority plants and also plant products. From April, all the regulated plants. And from the 1st of July, I see that's missing in the presentation, then the inspection level will be higher. Um, what's clear now is that plants will be submitted to phytosanitary uh, inspection. Um, in the presentation, it says probably flowers not, although that's quite recently that we've heard that probably also from the 1st of April, it might be very well possible that also flowers will need a phytosanitary certificate. So it's, um, yeah, I would like to make a, a comment on that as well, that also for your specific in, uh, situation, it's good to realize when you prepare the exporting process, if you combine the shipment with uh, products which are, uh, do need a certification and others who are not, whether you choose uh, if you uh, put them together in one shipment or not. Um, the costs we have calculated with are also based on the KPMG report. Then again, uh, they uh, mentioned that they expect the cost will be between 102 euros and 190 euros. Um, we validated these figures also with some exporting companies and they say it's, my, it's more possible that the cost will be 190 shipment and not 190 euros per shipment or perhaps even more. Uh, so we've calculated with that amount and based then again on the export value, the impact will be 0.4%. The fourth building block is the financial one. Yeah, we looked at the disposable income and what we have um, uh, worked with or what we uh, have based it on is that on forecast of uh, trading economics, it is expected that the disposable income this year will end negatively, minus 4%, and that it's also expected that the consumer expenses will decrease with minus 3%. Um, the downward trend is also expected for the upcoming year. Um, yeah, the expectations uh, will uh, be that it will be on the pre-COVID level early 2024. Um, the expectations are that also the British pound will decline in relation to the euro. So for our financial impact, we have calculated with a currency risk of minus 4% and a uh, decrease of the disposable income also with minus 4%, which means that the finan total financial impact on the export value will be uh, 8% in total. To summarize all this, um, we expect that the documentation cost will be 0.6%. The import duty is still uh, uncertain, as long as there is no deal, there is still no certainty about the 8% of the import duty on flowers. Um, delay, yeah, we calculate with 5%. Of course, that might vary, uh, but we know that for sure when we uh, start exporting uh, from January on. The same with currency risk, disposable income. So what we expect is that the total uh, impact might be 19.4%, so that's almost 20%, which is quite impressive. Um, documentation, like I said, is quite certain. The other factors is depending on the negotiations and also how the situation will look like from the 1st of January on in practice. The possible consequences, what we expect from the Brexit, is that at least for some growers, and especially some cut flower growers of chrysanthemums, lilies, and gerberas, we expect that will, there will be a, uh, an impact on demand for the flowers and also impact on the price of these uh, products. For buyers, 
yeah, like I uh, presented already, uh, there will be additional costs um, they have to face. And also probably there will be a decrease of uh, yeah, a decrease in demand for flowers. So will, it will affect their sales to the UK. For Royal Flora Holland, the flower auction, of course, this has an impact on our turnover, what we expect. And we also expect, because there might be a difference in import duty between cut flowers from the EU and cut flowers from uh, outside the EU, that there might be a shift from uh, cut flowers directly to the UK and perhaps not anymore via the Netherlands. Yeah, this was the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Aline, uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Some very interesting research on the impact from uh, Royal Flora Holland there. Uh, anything between 0.6 and 20% of impact. And so there's still many questions that need to be answered before we can fill in the gaps on there. But thank you for that. And we look forward to asking some questions more in the panel session later on. Many thanks, Eileen, much appreciated. Uh, now we move on to our next speaker and our next speaker is Stefan Kuhmann. Stefan is a senior market economist at Rabobank in the Netherlands. He's responsible for analyzing developments in the interest and currency markets and communicating to uh, Rabobank target groups. He's very focused on Brexit and the Bank of England and uh, he writes articles and commentary and presentations and uh, everything that moves the financial markets. So uh, Stefan, thank you very much. Today he's going to talk to us about the economics of trading with the UK post Brexit. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, yes, thank you, Tim. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can uh, see my slides. If not, uh, please uh, give me a shout. Um, yes, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, my name is Stefan Koopman, and I uh, work as an economist at Rabobank. And in the next uh, yeah, 10 minutes or so, I, I would like to shed some light on the latest developments in the, in the UK economy, uh, which faces uh, two quite significant shocks at the same time. And how does this could affect uh, the currency and the trade of uh, goods between uh, the EU and the UK? So around um, this time last year, right after the withdrawal agreement was signed, I asked myself, is this going to be a, a hard Brexit or is it going to be a, a so-called Brexit in a name only? Well, if I look at it only from an economic perspective, I would be inclined to think that it would be a very soft Brexit. Eh? After all, it's the most rational thing to do. But what these types of analysis uh, misses is that over the past two or three years even, the whole concept of Brexit has been defined in, uh, in a, a much harder way. Hi, Stefan, can I Hi, just yes. interrupt? Can you share your slides, please? So yes. Um, ah, this is it. Perfect. It should thank work. You. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I, I forgot to hit the start button. No problem. Yes. Um, yeah, Boris Johnson always uh, points out that uh, Brexit, without uh, taking back uh, control of the UK's rules and regulations, has no real purpose. And the EU, in turn, has been quite clear that this push for sovereignty from the UK side has a price. And it means that the UK will lose its direct uh, access to the EU uh, single market. And that trade between the EU and the UK will get much more complicated and much more costly. We've seen uh, pretty uh, a lot of examples already today. Um, yeah, the, the hope is that there will be a trade agreement and that mainly focuses on, on the trading goods. And, and the aim is here to achieve uh, zero tariffs and zero quotas. And that's some sort of consolation price, I think, uh, for today's audience, uh, which is mostly in the business of trading plants. But it still works out pretty negatively uh, for an entire economy that uh, mostly relies uh, on services production and services trade. So. What is the economic impact of Brexit? Well, that will be quite complicated to, to measure, uh, actually, because uh, we're in the midst of a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. And we now expect that the British economy will contract by 11.5% this year. And this is the steepest uh, economic contraction uh, that we've seen in the past 300 years. And we also expect that because of Brexit and some other risks, that there will be quite a slow recovery in the next two years. So, we have a forecast in the table uh, on the right hand side of this slide. And um, if there is a deal, we forecast GDP growth at 3.9% uh, in 2021 
and at 5.4% in 2022. If we don't get a deal, then we think the economy will grow, still grow, 0.9% in 2021 and 3.5% in 2022. So even though, even though we do forecast economic growth in both of these scenarios, we think that the recovery uh, from COVID and from Brexit will be uh, relatively incomplete and it will take a long time before GDP is back at the pre-pandemic levels. And this is because of uh, what Andy Haldane, he is the, the, the chief economist of the Central Bank of England, he calls it the unholy trinity of risks. And that means the coronavirus, practical realities of Brexit and the expected rise in, in unemployment that we are about to see in 2021. And you can also see this in the chart on the left. Uh, GDP dropped around 25% uh, actually uh, during the spring because of the first wave of COVID. And there has been uh, a recovery over the course of the summer, but it was, it was far from enough to, to compensate for these massive losses in the spring. So even before uh, the lockdown that we had in uh, November, GDP was still more than 9% uh, below its pre-pandemic peak. And the lockdown um, uh, creates uh, yet uh, another contraction in GDP. And our forecast is that in the fourth quarter of this year, so this is the current quarter, uh, the economy could co could contract around uh, 3% or, or something like that, 3 or 4%. So that's it's much lower than what we've seen in the second quarter because uh, various sectors of the economy, such as manufacturing or construction, are still, uh, still mostly open and, and uh, performing actually uh, quite well. So the pandemic and Brexit together is, is a very risky combination, but um, we don't expect that Brexit itself uh, would lead to yet another recession in 2021. But this, of course, assumes that there will be a deal and that the transition towards this deal will be relatively orderly. But we will see that uh, Brexit has some uh, pretty serious uh, long-term implications. And the chart on the left, indicates that we expect that it will take quite a while before GDP returns back to this pre-pandemic level. In the orange line, you can see our projections for a deal, and it shows that, um, that it will take until late uh, 2023, perhaps early 2024, before uh, we're back at where we were at the end of 2019. And if there's no deal, it will take even longer. And over time, a quite a, a wide gap could open up uh, between these two scenarios of a deal and no deal. And this gap uh, could amount in 10 years time towards around uh, 2,600 uh, G, uh, pounds sterling per capita per year. So that's quite a big effect. So even though the immediate impact of Brexit is um, being overshadowed by the virus, there's a clear consensus among economists that Brexit will have a negative effect on the UK's potential rate of economic growth. And you can see this potential rate as the rate of growth that the UK would typically achieve in a very normal year. Uh, so not this year, obviously. And this slide, what I'm showing you right now, is mostly for reverence. You can look into it later, so I won't go into all the details, but there's a, quite a simple um, rule of thumb among economists. And that says the bigger the economic distance between the EU and the UK, the bigger the economic consequences for the UK. And this is simply because the UK relies more on its trade with the EU than the other way around. And we've also done some, some studies into this uh, potential growth rate and found that it would be around a little lower than 2% if there was no Brexit at all. So if, if the, the 2016 referendum uh, proved to be a, a remain, uh, it will be around 1.5% if there is a Brexit with a deal and it will be around 1% if there is no trade deal at all. And this, yeah, it may sound like small differences, but if you add these up over time, yeah, you take a longer horizon, then it compounds uh, quite quite quickly, and then you get the, this significant impact that I show you uh, that I showed you in in the, in the previous slide. So eventually, the impact of Brexit will be larger than the impact of the virus. But even though the virus uh, caused a deep recession in this year, and Brexit uh, probably uh, won't cause a, a deep recession. So if you then take a look at the currency, and here I have some, some, some good news and some bad news for you. Uh, the good news is that the Brexit has already been reflected in the currency since uh, the, the plunge in the June 2016 referendum. And since then, you can see it on the chart on, on the right hand side, uh, sterling has been trading mostly sideways against the euro with uh, you have a natural ebb and flow that you typically see in, 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 these, kind of, in these kind of markets. 
Um, this implies that if the UK and the EU do strike a deal, we don't expect to see yet another sharp depreciation just because of the realities of Brexit. That said, even though the political risks uh, will decline, if there's a deal, we don't think that the pound will appreciate much either. Uh, the economic uncertainty that uh, the UK faces remains uh, quite large and uh, the UK will be structurally less uh, attractive for foreign capital uh, than it would have been if there was no Brexit. So our, our central forecast is, and you can see that in the orange line in this chart, is that uh, Euro sterling would move from 89, 90 cents uh, that it is currently trading at to around uh, 87 cents over the, uh, the course of 2021. So you can see this again in the, in the, in the table uh, below. Um, it will be different if there's no deal, of course. The financial markets, if, if you look at the, um, the, the price action over the past couple of weeks and months, have been, have been fairly optimistic on these Brexit negotiations. Even though there's a lot of rumbling going on and a lot of uh, negative headlines, um, markets still think that this is part of the, the regular choreography of, of, of a deal. So if it still breaks down, and that's very much a possibility, the traders will try to sell the pound and buy back dollars or euros. But the risk of a very sharp depreciation, as it uh, was in, in, in 2019, is, is, is less pronounced, I think. Uh, we reckon that we could see a move in case of a no-deal Brexit of, of euro sterling towards uh, 93, perhaps 95 cents. You can see that in the light blue line on this chart. There's also a dotted line here, and this is the, the worst case scenario in where all the risks that uh, the UK currently faces materialize. Eh? You can think of a no-deal Brexit, uh, vaccines that are still delayed or ineffective, new lockdowns, uh, a sharp rise in unemployment, and negative uh, interest rates from the central bank. In such a scenario, which is definitely not our, our base case scenario, uh, you could expect that the pound could move towards an uh, exchange rate of one against the euro. And obviously that would make uh, UK imports of EU goods uh, very expensive. And also because we're likely to see uh, some tariffs that are average around 8% um, on, on such a scenario. So that would be uh, a worst case scenario that is definitely not, uh, not our base case forecast. Then finally, how would this all affect the trade between the EU and the UK? Uh, regardless of, of whether a deal is struck, the, the costs of trade will rise. Uh, Aileen just told you all about it uh, in the previous presentation because of this wide variety of, of non-tariff barriers. And these have an equivalent tariff value of around 5 to, to 10%, and that depends on the product that you're trading. And this is broadly the same as the average tariff would be if there was a no-deal Brexit. So that Im basically implies that uh, this deal is some way, uh, somewhere a halfway house between no deal and no Brexit at all. Then we also have the expected rise in unemployment. The UK government has been very, very generous with uh, its furlough scheme, but it is now expected to stop in March. And the official forecast from the OBR is that unemployment will rise to 7.5% uh, in the summer of next year. And we think it could even be a little higher and forecast uh, a rate between 7.5 and 8%. So what this means is that the income and the confidence of the UK consumers will remain uh, under pressure, even as the economy starts to recover from COVID. And we forecast that uh, total consumer spending on goods next year could drop two to 3% relative to what we have seen over the course of the summer, so after uh, the lockdowns. And if you then take the exchange rate as well, yeah, this could be uh, actually a, a quite a, a quite a positive factor of around two percent, given that we expect that the pound uh, appreciates slightly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the euro. But this is again this based on the premise premise of a deal, and otherwise we would see a, a depreciation of around four uh, percent. So if you had all these factors together, and then you also have to make uh, a variety of assumptions on on the price elasticity of your product. And these elasticities are uh, the sensitivity of your sales volumes to a 1% change in the selling price or a 1% change in the income of the consumer or a 1% change in the relative price to other goods that don't need to be imported or doesn't, don't face any uh, tariff or tariff barriers. And we all know that these elasticities are quite high for, for uh, luxury goods, uh, which are uh, nice to have, but that they are lower for yeah, the necessities eh, which are need to have so you have to judge for yourself whether your good is a nice to have or a need to have but if you combine all these estimated elasticities uh, with the expected increase in the prices 
we can calculate that the expected drop in trade volumes from the EU to the UK is around 5% for basic products and around 15% for, for luxury products. So that's quite a, a steep drop in volume and, and that, that rhymes relatively well with the analysis, with the analysis that uh, Aileen just provided you. And with that, I'd like to hand over the virtual mic uh, back over to you, Tim. Stefan, thank you very much. Um, that was a really uh, helpful insight into your predictions of uh, what will or won't happen in, in the coming days on the different scenarios that we uh, have ahead of us. And it uh, be interesting to uh, find the views of the audience on whether they see us as a essential or a luxury item, uh, five or 15% in terms of the drop in trade uh, and somewhere in between, I'm sure. Uh, Stefan, thank you very much uh, for that. And we look forward to you joining us in the panel later on. Um, we're going to, now we're a couple of minutes over time, but we're going to take a five minutes break just to give you a little pause before we start back. So uh, please come back in five minutes and uh, we will recommence. Thank you. The World Horti Society Business Lounge is the new network club in the World Horti Center. Deze community is voor iedereen met een hart voor de tuinbouw. Van telers tot toeleveranciers, van overheidsmedewerkers tot exporteurs, van veredelaars tot retail, maar ook mensen van buiten de tuinbouwsector zijn welkom. Als je maar een hart hebt voor de tuinbouw. Ik word erg enthousiast van uh, initiatieven als de World Hortie Society. Ik denk dat het uh, belangrijk is, zeker in deze tijd, dat wij samen optrekken. Het beeld van onze sector uh, moeten wij vormen, niet anderen. Dus als wij samen kunnen optrekken, dan is dat een grote meerwaarde voor, voor ons, maar ook zeker voor onze sector. Het World Horti Center is het kloppend hart van de glastuinbouw. En de World Horti Society is haar hartslag. Ontmoet nieuwe mensen, vergroot je netwerk en krijg energie van de goede gesprekken. Zo ontstaan nieuwe ideeën, nieuwe samenwerkingen en nieuwe verbindingen die het hart van de glastuinbouw sneller laten kloppen. Niemand is volledig en zeker een bedrijf niet. Door... Uh... Lid te worden van zo'n businessclub kan je dat uh, optimaliseren. En hoe goed we ook zijn op onszelf, met meer samenwerking, dan wordt alles toch beter. De businessclub van World Horty Center, dat zorgt voor die vooruitgang en voor die verandering dat dat mogelijk wordt.
The World Horti Society Business Lounge is de nieuwe netwerkclub binnen World Horti Center. Deze community is voor iedereen met een hart voor de tuinbouw. Van telers tot toeleveranciers, van overheidsmedewerkers tot exporteurs, van veredelaars tot retail, maar ook mensen van buiten de tuinbouwsector zijn welkom. Als je maar een hart hebt voor de tuinbouw. Ik word erg enthousiast van uh, initiatieven als de World Horti Society. Ik denk dat het uh, belangrijk is, zeker in deze tijd, dat wij samen optrekken. Het beeld van onze sector uh, moeten wij vormen, niet anderen. Dus als wij samen kunnen optrekken, dan is dat een grote meerwaarde voor, voor ons, maar ook zeker voor onze sector. Het World Horti Center is het kloppend hart van de glastuinbouw. En de World Horti Society is haar hartslag. Ontmoet nieuwe mensen, vergroot je netwerk en krijg energie van de goede gesprekken. Zo ontstaan nieuwe ideeën, nieuwe samenwerkingen en nieuwe verbindingen die het hart van de glastuinbouw sneller laten kloppen. Niemand. Welcome, welcome back. Uh, we're going to carry on our webinar in preparation for uh, Brexit. And uh, we are pleased now to uh, introduce in the beginning of this year, won the Silver Award in the AIPH International Grower of the Year Awards. He's also a guest columnist in Floriculture International magazine. So welcome, Bruce. And uh, we're going to pass over to you now to share your thoughts on upcoming Brexit. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Can you hear me? Yeah. As yes. Tim said, my name, my name is Bruce Arnett. I'm a managing director of uh, Kernock Park Plants. Um, as Tim says, yeah, young plant producer, um, specialist propagator in uh, England, United Kingdom. So I, I'm probably listening to a lot of the other speakers. I'm going to reiterate a little bit and add to some of the previous content. Um, but I've been asked to speak uh, to give my perspective of the current situation surrounding the impending EU exit as a grower producer, both an importer and an exporter. So to put Kernock Park plants into context, to this context, uh, the majority of our imports originate actually from third countries outside of the EU, but we also source a significant amount from or through the EU as well. And most of our sales at the same time uh, are mainland UK, but nearly 10% of our sales revenue is contributed from exports to EU Um, now, of course, including uh, Northern Ireland, if, uh, as Sally uh, uh, alluded to, if we were to adhere to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which essentially brings Northern Ireland into the EU regulation in so many respects, including the plant health area. So in general, my feelings, is the complexities of the uh, potential duty, the VAT and the, the tariffs, especially without a trade agreement to understand, has been mentioned several times, Um, which formalities will be waived, which will remain in force, is a significant concern for us and many others like us at this time. Um, and I'm certainly not clear on whether things like the general system of preferences will be enacted, for example. We still don't know whether and, and how much the goods for import or export will eventually cost from January and July, and which of these costs can be deferred or paid on invoice, etc. There's still so much clarity that's required as far as I can see. The administrative tasks involve simply understanding the jargon, um, the many, many acronyms that we now need to be aware of. We could probably now fill a, a new dictionary to cover the glossary of terms that I've, I've been looking at over the last two or three months related to the process of import and export to our nearest neighbours. The systems of Idomoro, Peach Chief, whilst being, uh, being aware we need to integrate uh, eventually into goods vehicle movement systems, the GVMS, HMRCs, NCTS, the new computerized transit system, whilst being aware also that IPAS, the import of products and animals, food and feed systems, and the CDS customer declaration systems is all to come, not to forget the uh, TSS, the uh, trade support for service for export to Northern Ireland. It's, it's clearly overwhelming for nearly everybody concerned. Um, there's so much information and so much uh, misinformation, to be honest, being shared between suppliers, distributors, hauliers, couriers, some of which is actually deriving from people you would imagine to be trusted information sources. Um, even if we can put all of the systems into place, pull the necessary administration into the process, this is, of course, costing thousands of pounds, as I think has been mentioned already, and euros for each company involved. Um, and I think some of the estimates of how much it's going to cost is, is probably underplayed, I think. Um, and, and I don't think for any discernible benefit. 
So it's fair to say that, that part of the current confusion is due to the lack of preparation. COVID, of course, has been cited already as, as part of these delays, but it seems to me that there's too many phases and steps uh, uh, for both customs and plant health side. I understand the principle of, of gradual introduction of these new new systems, but if we all, all have and, and cru crucially understand the final goal, um, uh, but without a vision of understanding what's at the end, I feel like we're, we're tasked simply with learning lots of new systems, um, some of which will be defunct very soon after the 1st of January, rather than simply preparing properly for, for the final stage with a clear vision of what that should be. On to import checks. Sally mentioned earlier the border operating model is not yet fully defined. I have to say that I have significant concerns for the in, intention to perform all the checks at the port of entry from July 2021. I'm fairly confident that once imports are eventually arriving on UK shores, uh, the BCPs will, will realise the volume and the bulk of the material uh, will be logistically overwhelming, even if they intend to create new inland inspection sites, as well as only inspecting sample portions has been cited, um, as they do for uh, current third country uh, live produce. I'm pretty sure that um, even if the four hour service levels are met by well-meaning um, plant health inspectors, they'll be under incredible time pressure um, to get product checked at PODs before the input, that's for the, in for the uh, Im imports of course, and also on the export side, I also hear many suppliers that are concerned about the turnaround times for short notice deliveries in particular for export, particularly fresh produce with the perishable product, short, um, short shelf life. The notification periods are required at the moment. Current guidance is seven days to organise plant health inspections, make the, the just-in-time export seem totally non-practical and, and non-viable. I think it's also fair to say that there have been some moves to, to help ensure that the, the import from the EU is as smooth as possible with some delays in the cost and the phasing of the process. Although eventually there's still a massive additional burden for importers, exporters and their hauliers. I know that my inbox personally is, is steadily increased on these Brexit related emails. Um, several per day are asking if we've registered for X or signed letters of authorization for why etc and on that uh, phytosanitary uh, biosecurity uh, uh, barriers we, we all see and i think sally again mentioned earlier the necessity for tight biosecurity in order to prevent unwanted transfer of pest and disease across a borders whichever way you go threat to indigenous species is in nobody's interest but we have to realize that there's no immediate change to biosecurity risk from january the first and i hope the pragmatists realize this um, when we actually eventually get there. There have been calls to delay the introductions of phytosanitary checks for imports from the EU, and um, that includes what are known as uh, the high priority plants. That's most of the plants, to be honest, that will be uh, exported for sure. Until the system uh, and infrastructure is well embedded and un understood. One of the reasons for the calls uh, for, for a delay is that there's been so much confusion on the exact interpretation of the regulations. The fact is the regulations for EU imports have, have a basis in history, um, uh, that's the import or export to the EU, if you like, have a basis in history, primarily geared towards imports from um, countries much further afield than neighbouring GB. At this moment, there is a, a list of prohibited plants issued uh, from EU authorities, such as Petunia being a solanaceous plant, um, among many other species of grass and, and fragaria, etc., that we are unable to ship to our customers in Europe, including Northern Ireland. And I understand that equivalence on this is trying to be sought. Um, and I hope that is uh, done uh, urgently because at the moment we have many orders which we simply won't be able to ship if the rules continue. Perhaps naively, I hope that if we can um, overcome the, the politics of the negotiations in the very near term, then the pragmatic solutions along the lines of what the HDA is suggesting, I, th I think we can abolish all the incredible amounts of green tape uh, uh, and utilize a system of plant passports that is working at the moment, a self-issued passport that is verified by means of frequent plant uh, inspections, annual plant passport ratification seems perfectly sensible to me, uh, much along the lines of what uh, Sally said earlier in a trusted trader type situation using a scheme that's already essentially been created, plant passports. And of course, a lot of people are listening and, and listening to the rubber bank uh, 
you know, we might say that this is uh, this is our fault. We should stop moaning about it. Um, it certainly is our fault that we have to endure these difficulties. Um, this has been brought on by the British people uh, following the 2016 referendum and subsequent actions of our government. Um, and it's now for us to try and find the best solutions given the circumstances. And, and I think it'd be naive to think that there were not some potential positives that come from this. Better communication, perhaps consolidation of supplies, better organisation between the UK and EU. And of course, if I look selfishly from a GB point of view, the harder this becomes to import from the EU into the uh, UK, the more likely the customers are turning, of course, to UK supply. I accept that. And we'll be doing, of course, everything to capture the potential increase uh, as, a, as a GB uh, based company um, with the increase of demand that's coming from the UK. But we'd be foolish to think, I think, uh, uh, foolish to think that we can supply the huge demand that the UK, UK grows without import from the EU, without significant changes over many, many years. Also, we seem to be significantly disadvantaged currently as plant exporters at this particular time. So as far as I'm concerned, we need to establish some sort of level playing field. Um, sensible trading relationship is the preferred model rather than one which sees significant reduction in trade, both import and export, due to the barriers, the administrative, administrative logistical and financial burdens. Thank you very much. Bruce, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great overview of how you see the impact on your business. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and we look forward to um, uh, having you join us in the panel if anyone has any questions for Bruce. Uh, there were no, there are no slides for Bruce's presentation. He was just talking from his heart and his experience about uh, what's coming. So uh, please, if you have any questions for him, then specify that on the chat. Thank you, Bruce, again. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker, which is Mr. Hank Vesterhoff. He's the president of Royal Anthos since 1985, in fact, and he's chairman of Eibol since 2011. And uh, he is going to uh, talk to us uh, today about how EU growers are reacting to Brexit and what they are doing. So, Hank, welcome to the webinar, and we pass over to you now. Tim, thank you very much. And I would like to ask Lars to start my presentation because he would take care of it. Yeah, thank you very much, Lars. Um, yeah, my name is Hank Westerhoff, as Tim already introduced me. I am the president of Royal Antos, and Royal Antos is an association uh, located in the Netherlands, and we look after the interests of our members, and those members are in particular trade companies of the flower bulb and, uh, and nursery stock. Um, we, as an association, we are involved in national and international plant health regulations, uh, as Tim already said, we have a, uh, a foundation called iBulb, and iBulb is the promotion of flower bulbs and bulb flowers worldwide. We uh, develop and invest a lot of money in the research, and we are also involved in issues regarding quality and, and sustainability. And a new chapter to uh, our services towards our members is, of course, Brexit, because this is an issue that is uh, really important and Per day, we get many, many questions uh, about what's going to happen and what do I have to do as a, as a company and how do I have to uh, react on, uh, well, the things that are coming up. What we uh, see, and that is, I think this is, uh, well, this is something that I uh, used from a presentation from uh, Tim Hedema, our agricultural counselor in the Netherlands, who gives a lot of support to my association, but also to the companies in the Netherlands to uh, learn more about all the regulations with regard to uh, Brexit and what's going to happen. Uh, but as we all, all see, and that's also what Sally said, uh, with time, time is running out. And, and that is true. Uh, uh, we have just 29 days, or as Sally said, 20 days to go. And in 20 days, uh, we I hope to learn whether we will have a deal or a no deal. Uh, but the situation is, is, is very difficult for the trade companies here in the Netherlands, not only the trade, but also the growers, because there is a lot of concern about what's go what will happen, in particular with the regard to phytosanitary issues, but also from an economical standpoint, uh, what will be the effect of Brexit on, on the trade? And Royal Flora Holland, Evelyn already said something about it, and uh, Stefan in his presentation from the Rabobank 
also gave uh, uh, an update uh, about uh, well possible consequences of uh, of Brexit in particular with uh, with no deal. What we have to realize here in the Netherlands, and that's what we learn our members, whether it will be a deal or no deal, that in case of a deal, uh, our members uh, have to uh, uh, to meet special new requirements with regard to phytosanitary inspections, and they also have to deal with, with customs. So if there is a deal, uh, there certainly will be a uh, there certainly will be a big difference for the uh, for the exporters. And what we learn from the exporters in the flower bulb business is that most of their export is already to non-European countries. So they are well experienced in, in uh, how to handle the inspections, how to handle all the paperwork uh, for customs, but also the phytosanitary certificates. But Evelyn already referred to it as well. We also have a lot of companies here in the Netherlands who have no experience with export to non-European countries. And for them, it's a big, big challenge to meet all the requirements which are a, a follow-up or a consequence of, uh, of Brexit. So that is certainly uh, an issue for those companies. What we see for, uh, for our industry, for the flower bulbs and the nursery stock, uh, the UK is, is a very important market for the flower bulbs. We talk about an export value per year of about six, uh, of about 70 million euro. And that's approximately 6% of our total turnover in 2019. Uh, but what you see in the nursery stock is about 240 million euro, and that's 17%. After Germany, the UK is for the nursery stock business, uh, uh, the most important export market. Uh, so people, uh, the companies here in the Netherlands are very concerned because they do not know exactly what's going to happen. And it certainly will have an effect on their, uh, on their trade. What you also uh, see, and that's what I also would like to say something about, is the customs in the UK, the customers from the, uh, that the exporters deal with. On the one hand, we deal with retailers, uh, in particular with the sales of prepacked flower bulbs, uh, which are used by the consumers for garden use. But on the other hand, we also have a large uh, export of flower bulbs and nursery stock products to, to professional growers. For example, flower bulbs, tulip bulbs, or lily bulbs which are used by the growers in the UK for the production of flowers, uh, which are sold to the, uh, to, the, to the consumers and to the retail in the UK. But on the other hand, we also have to deal with the municip municipalities and the landscaping market, and last but not least, with the mail order. And why do I refer to these customers? Well, there is a lot of confusion here in the Netherlands, and it also depends uh, who is your customer in the, United, in, uh, in the UK. On the one hand, we uh, see that if you uh, supply flower bulbs, for example, to a, to a retail outlet or to the retail, we all know that the big retailers have their own dis distribution center. Uh, uh, and the distribution center, what, what we learned, that is uh, called the place of destination. That is also the place where the inspection can take place, and that is also the place to issue a plant passport. But the situation is, is quite different for an exporter if he delivers his products to the municipalities. Because what is the place of destination? What is the place where the inspection will take place? And what are the requirements when a truck is loaded with planting material for th more than three locations? Uh, and then we get a lot of questions from exporters. They say, where does the inspection take place in such a case? And that's also something that uh, Sally referred to, what she, what she called the multiple drop. But these are questions that exporters here in the Netherlands deal with, and they urgently ask for questions. But we are not in a position to give all the, uh, the questions, to answer all the questions, because uh, it is not quite clear what DEFRA exactly wants and what the requirements will be in the, in the next, uh, uh, for the next year after Brexit. If you look to economics, uh, we are not in a situation from the flower bulb business and also not from the nursery stock business that we did a commercial impact like uh, Royal Flora Holland did. But what we also learned from the presentation of Stefan, uh, we, uh, uh, in case that there will be no deal, it certainly will have an effect on, uh, on the sales of our products to the UK. The currency is a big issue. And what I learned from Stefan is that he said, well, if there is, there might be in a no deal situation a depreciation of about 4%. As I said before, we have a lot of export to non European countries, and we know from experience that a devaluation of a currency has a huge effect on the sales and the export of our products. So we are very concerned about that. 
Another issue that we deal with is the import tariffs. Import tariffs, uh, there is no import tariffs, as we have learned now by now, that for the nursery stock it's 0%, but for the flower bulbs there will be an import tariff. Uh, and, of course, the exporters here in the Netherlands also have to deal with additional costs. Evelina already referred to it, but as I said, we have to deal with customs, we have to deal with phytosanitary inspections, uh, and also a phytosanitary certificate has to be issued, and it all has to be paid. And as far as logistics is concerned, just in time delivery will be very, uh, will be very, very difficult and perhaps not possible in the near future. And it is very risky because when you have a delay, you also have to keep in mind that it will lead to extra cost for the exporters or perhaps also for their customers. So from an economical point of view, and that's also where Stefan referred to, he said, yeah, uh, more Brexit will be more sensitive uh, to products, uh, to so-called luxury goods. And Tim asked the question, uh, do our products belong to luxury goods or is it, is it a need to have? Well, to answer that question, I think that most of our products are so-called luxury products. So I think that when, uh, uh, in case of a no deal, it certainly will have a big effect. And if we talk about a reduction or a drop of 15% of the volume, that will have a huge impact on the flower bill business and also on the nursery stock business. I also mentioned something about local for local. In the nursery, business, in the nursery stock business, we learn a lot and we hear rumors that people in the UK say, well, we, we should uh, refer more to UK produced uh, uh, products. Uh, instead of importing them from EU countries or non-EU countries. That also might have effect, effect uh, on, the, uh, on the sales and the export volume from the Netherlands to, uh, to the UK, because as I already explained, we talk about an export volume of about 245 million euro per year. On the other hand, if you go from local to local in the UK, it also might be a challenge. Uh, let's say for if, if we have the export of flower bulbs, uh, tulip bulbs, or lily bulbs, as I said, to professional growers who sell the product to the retail in the UK. Uh, if the product is sol sold as local for local, uh, locally produced, that is something that can give a push to the uh, export and the sales of this uh, in the UK grown product. For your uh, information and as an example, we run big promotion campaigns in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, in particular for the cut tulips, where, the, where we tell the people and the retail and the, and the customers and the consumers uh, that they have to buy locally produced tulips and that is a big, big success. Uh, so perhaps it is a challenge for the future that we can also start such a campaign in the UK. You never know. What we do know here in the Netherlands is that the custom requirements and the phytosanitary inspections. I think there is no discussion about it, uh, also based on the information that we get from, uh, from our government, uh, the, the, the Department of Agriculture. They give a lot of information with the help of our agricultural councillor in the UK. Uh, so I think that as far as the information we give to our members, uh, it is uh, as far as the situation here in Holland is concerned, People know what to do and how to act. The situation is different and I was very glad with the presentation of Sally uh, because she referred to some kind of the issues that we, uh, that we do not know here in the Netherlands. Uh, the import inspections, where and when. Of course, we know a little bit more and of course, we have learned about the place of destination. But I already referred to uh, the situation per customer, whether it is a municipality or a retail uh, how do the inspections take place, where do the inspections take, take place and how to issue a, uh, an English plan passport. That is one of the questions we deal. Uh, but the most important part at this moment, and we get a lot of questions about that, and Evelyn also referred to it, is phytosanitary standards. At the moment, we live in a European Union and we have to, and we deal, uh, and the UK too, as far as the, uh, uh, the, the plant health regulations is concerned. Um, it is clear, it is a harmonized system and it is uh, harmonized standards and we know uh, how to act and we know what the requirements are. But for the future, it is still uncertain. What will be the phytosanitary standards that the UK will use? One of the questions we get, and it's just very practical, is will it be free of soil or practically free of soil? Must, my, must the products or have the products to be free of soil 
or practically free of soil. This is a big issue because we already have companies who make preparations for next export season and they have to know now. Uh, we heard and we also saw uh, draft requirements for phytosanitary standards. We uh, learned that they were issued last week, but honestly speaking, it is very, very complicated to learn about what will it be, what will be the situation and what will be the new standards, if there will be any new standards or whether the UK will use the standards that we have now in the European Union. So this is something uh, that, well, we would like to see, but I know it is a wish and I do not know whether it can be fulfilled, but a delay of the implementation of the plant health regulations, that would be, uh, that would be good. I think it is, uh, uh, as I said, we have uh, a couple of days to go, 20 days or 29 days. And I think it's not realistic to come to an agreement on all the issues that we, uh, that we deal with at this moment. There are so many questions and I think it will be in the benefit of the exporters, but also in the benefit of the, uh, the UK importers if we come to a delay on the plant health regulations and that we take time to come to an agreement in that respect. Well, Tim, this was uh, the issues that uh, that we have to deal with. These are the uncertainties that our members deal with. These are the uncertainties that the growers in the Netherlands deal with. And honestly speaking, I do not know whether we get an answer, clear answer before the end of the year. And that's the reason that I would be in favor of having a delay in the implementation of the plant health regulations. Thank you very much. Hank, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that overview of uh, the situation that uh, Dutch traders, exporters are looking, uh, are dealing with. And uh, of course, uh, as with many of these speakers, we raise many questions as, as much as we do uh, answers on what it is happening. But thank you very much for that. Now, please, can the uh, panel members stay and join the uh, join? So everyone come back in if you wouldn't mind. And uh, we have some uh, questions uh, that we're going to uh, put to you. Uh, we have uh, not a lot of time and we have a lot of questions, so that is the problem. So if we do not answer all of the questions that have been raised, what we are going to do is try and answer them afterwards, and then we will send you an email uh, with, the, uh, with the best answer we can uh, provide uh, after the event. Um, so um, let's go back uh, to the beginning. We had uh, Sally. And uh, thank you again, Sally, for that overview. And I have a big list of questions for you. I think I maybe will just pick out one or two. Um, and uh, uh, one of the questions is, is, can we find a list somewhere of which plants are high risk? When you say high risk, um, is this the high priority plants that you're referring to? Uh, so those that are regulated from the 1st of January? Uh, well, this is just the question that has been raised, but I guess so. Yes, um, it may be, though. Are, are there? Is there any way in which that list is likely to be broken down in any more uh, detail? Well, if, if it's all regulated plants from the 1st of January, then it's um, everything that is currently within the EU plant passport regime. So that's all plants for planting. But they're not high risk plants. They're high priority plants. So I think in my presentation, I explained Originally, they were they were labelled as high risk, and that was confusing because the EU currently has a high risk list of plants which are prohibited for import from third countries. So um, GB will not be able to import to EU that list because we will be a third country. But GB has exempted the EU from that list. So therefore, that high risk plant list um, is exempted for EU to GB trade. So this starts with Acer and ends with um, uh, Quercus and, and all of those guys. So there is a list, but it's not prohibited to import into GB, but it is prohibited to export to Northern Ireland. <laughs> okay, just to uh, complicate it. Do you uh, exactly. imagine a situation where um, uh, you can, we can have end up with a list of plants that we can assume are not going to require uh, an inspection at a pod uh, and to be able to come right through? So assume 10% minimum inspections of everything finished going to a place of destination. Um, it will be more than that. The intention is more. And now we're talking about the frequency of inspections and which species are more likely to attract an inspection. 
So we are working with DEFRA on that. We have an initial list, um, and it certainly starts at the top of the Xylella high-risk host list. Now, at the moment, um, we have no uh, hint from DEFRA that they're going to reintroduce those national measures. I think they're going to go down the route of import infections um, and very high frequency, like 100% maybe, um, rather than there won't be any ban on those commodities. They're too important to the UK trade, and that's something HTA have made it very clear um, to DEFRA. Okay. Uh Thank you. Uh, Hank, is, uh, I can see some expressions on Hank's face for these things. Yeah. Did you want to make any comment on that? Yeah, well, the question I have to Sally uh, is that um, why does it take that long that we get uh, uh, more information about the requirements uh, from DEFRA? Uh, uh, now we're running out of time. As I said, we have 20 days to go uh, and a lot of things have not been solved yet. Uh, uh, what is the reason that DEFRA didn't give the information earlier? Is it that complicated or what? No. what's the reason? I don't have the answer for you, Henk. Um, although we have communication regularly with DEFRA about all of these details, I think there are so many details and it might be a bit my fault as well because I keep coming up with issues that they need to have answers to. Um, but then we need to look through those issues. So we need to have answers about how many places of destination can a phytosanitary cover? All of that information needs to be sorted through and worked through in systems. Um, so I can't speak on behalf of DEFRA. I'm sure they've got reasons why we're coming to this so late. Um, but there are there are a lot of reasons um, to do with the complexity of this year. We've all come to it very late. We didn't even start communicating with DEFRA regularly until July. Um, there seems to be other things going on um, and we thought we'd sort of planned for no deal um, but it turns out it was a lot more complicated than that once we get down to the, to the nitty gritty. Can I ask one other question? Um, if I may say so, uh, Tim, uh, do you think there is any chance that we come to a delay in particular on phytosanitary issues? The political will has to be there, Hank. Um, we've got a full-on high-profile political campaign that kicked off recently. Um, we held a, a round table for politicians last week. Um, we're meeting regularly with the ministers in government um, to put forward our case. We'll see questions coming up, um, written, or written questions to government. Um, from my political supporters, they're continuously coming up. I think we've got about 12 in for answering at the moment, all highlighting the fact and pushing the ask um, that import inspections should be suspended and the action of pre-notification, although it's useful because it then gathers trade data, which can then be applied properly to um, target the right inspections to the right places. Um, and we need that import data in order to do that. But actually, pre-notification until IT systems are, are up and running and fit for purpose, um, that should be put on hold until at least the 1st of July. That, that's our um, stance at the moment. But well, if, I, if, I, <laughs> if I can come in, in here, uh, Tim. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, it does seem to me, um, I know there's a lot of concerns, and I get emails from uh, potential suppliers and, and importers, um, but it does seem like uh, DEFRA uh, have... Uh, essentially wiped aside a lot of the restrictions because they've tried to make the, the trade in inward to GB quite smooth. Um, to me, there seems to be more of an issue of the export, which of course is a, is a lot smaller uh, element. Um, but that's, that's more of a concern to me because of things like the high priority, what they call the, the high priority plants, which I mentioned in my uh, little presentation, talking about things like, uh, you know, all of those petunias and calibacos, for example, that we won't be able to send out from GB to, to Ireland for at this particular point in time, including Northern Ireland. So I think actually the, the import side of things, aside from having to make a phytosanitary certificate, which of course I don't want either uh, for all of our imports. Um, mm. But I think it seems to me, I don't know whether you agree, Sally, that generally uh, the, 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 the transition into import is not as bad as the export side of things. That's quite correct, Bruce. I concur with that. 
Okay, thanks for that comment, uh, Bruce, as well. I mean, we have a, a, a question about whether from the EU side it's possible for them to uh, identify a, a pod point for where the inspection can carry out. Can they contact from DEFRA outside or can it, does it have to be done from within the UK? Sally. Um, so you must have a UK based agent or um, a, a limited company. You have to have a company in GB to act as the importer. Um, that importer can then do the pre-notification, which includes registering a place of destination. So really GB customers need to be registering themselves as places of destination, unless you've rented a warehouse, for example, to be that place of destination. Does that, I know that's a bit garbled, but um, it's a yes and a no. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> we understand the confusion of the situation. Will there be uh, uh, AFA inspectors based in the Netherlands uh, to support the um, plant health certification leaving the Netherlands, for example? Not from day one, but I think I touched in my, in my presentation that um, that's one of the the things that we're looking at, and there's there's um, there's appetite for that certainly within within DEFA and AFA, um, because it would make their lives easier, and it would also enable us to streamline, and you guys um, to streamline exports and imports. But it won't. It's not the answer for the whole supply chain. It's just another element that we could add in to make life easier for us. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, Hank, I'm wondering the uh, suppliers who are supplying to uh, landscape uh, projects directly. How are they managing uh, in terms of the uh, inspection system at the moment? Well, at, at the moment, uh, <laughs> there is no inspection in the. Well, UK. I, I mean, uh, yeah, after first of January, what is that? Yeah, well, that's a, that is one of the questions that I raised. People do not know, honestly speaking, and in particular, if you uh, deliver your planting material to three or four different locations, and that's what's happening. Uh, yeah, then the question is, what is the place of uh, destination? Where will it be inspected? And we get a lot of questions like that, because if you, what I said, if you go to a, a retail chain, then probably the, uh, the distribution center will be the place where the, the, the place of destination where an inspection can take place. But if you supply to a municipality or landscaping, then uh, honestly speaking, I do not know. And my, <laughs> I don't know. And I can't, we cannot answer that question to our members be, because it's not clear. And those are the issues that our people deal with. So there are a lot of question marks in the air and we do not get the right answer at the moment. Yeah, okay, thank you. And we will, uh, uh, I know that uh, we will, when we find out that answers of those things as well, we can help to communicate them uh, back to we you as well once the information yeah. comes through. Um, I wonder if we can uh, just go to Aline, uh, please, uh, for a question on, I wonder what, from the analysis work that you did in Royal Flora Holland, what are you planning to do with the outcome of this analysis? Um, yes, that's a good question, Tim. Um, yeah, what, what the analysis uh, brought us is, of course, much more insight in the consequences of the uh, uh, Brexit. Brexit. Um, but it would be a little bit late if we would act or uh, just now uh, preparing for the Brexit. So since the beginning, when the Brexit was announced or when it was clear that the Brexit was uh, yeah, going to happen, of course, we followed the, the developments very close from our uh, lobby department. And yeah, actually, the main goal for us is to mitigate the risk of, of the Brexit, so to yeah, when possible to keep the import uh, duties as low as possible and as little as trade barriers as uh, yeah as little as possible. Um, yeah, we don't do that by ourselves because in uh, the Netherlands on national level we work very close together also with the VGB, the trade association in the Netherlands, and on European level uh, together with the Union Fleur. And yeah. I think the 1st of, uh, of uh, January next year, we know uh, whether we have been successful, but actually, well, that's what we're aiming for, to mitigate the risk. Yeah, sure. And, you know, on one hand, we've just seen a lot of the costs and the issues that they're facing. Do you see opportunities as well uh, as you look forward? Um, yeah, the risk, like I mentioned in my presentation, might be that there might be a shift, uh, uh, yeah, for, for, from direct uh, deals uh, which don't go anymore via the Netherlands. 
but what I hope for, and I also got a feeling that since we know the Brexit is about to happen, that we've seen in the Netherlands that everybody has started preparing them, uh, at least most of them very well, already last year, the year before, although still not everything is clear. Um, but what I've seen and noticed is that we have started preparing as, as good as possible, as well as possible um, from uh, entrepreneurs, but also in very close connection with uh, the Dutch Customs and the NVWA, which I would like to mention as well uh, in this webinar as well, that I think that's very uh, unique, uh, the close contact and also the constructive contact we have uh, uh, we have uh, during this process. So I hope uh, that the Netherlands will be very, very well prepared and that, that also in this uh, new situation that might be also perhaps a unique selling point that we have organized the process so very well that we will be, uh, keep, will be attractive or perhaps even more attractive uh, to facilitate in the flows and the commercial flows, logistic flows via the Netherlands to the UK. Okay, that's an interesting uh, point you make. Finally, there. I mean, that, the last question I had for you was what what it means in ter what your analysis means in terms of the competitiveness of the Netherlands in this marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that that question has a bit of kind of relation with the with the, your former question. Um, when it comes to the competitiveness, if you look price wise, then of course the. Um, when uh, the import duty will be charged, then uh, EU flowers and flowers from the Netherlands will be less interesting compared to uh, flowers from uh, the non-EU. Um, but I hope this, yeah, price is just one uh, one thing. Uh, uh, I won't say not important, but it's just one aspect uh, while doing trade. So I hope. But we have already a long uh, relation, business relationship with the UK. And also, if we try to organize the process very smooth and very well, then, um, yeah, I hope that we can uh, yeah, be at least uh, attractive uh, for flower business uh, like we are today. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, thank you for your um, presentation and review of the economic situation. We have a question from the audience. Will there be any changes in transferring money from the UK to the EU or vice versa? Hi, yes, yeah. Well, as I understand it, um, the UK will maintain uh, its participation in the single euro uh, payments area, even though um, uh, this, this APA has a, has a much uh, wider uh, geographic scope than just the EU. The, the EU. So SEPA transactions could still take place after the January 1st, um, even though these typically need more information, more details, uh, than if the UK remained um, a participant of the single market of the EU. Mm -hmm. And the European Payments Council is, is one of the entities that is involved in, in these matters. And uh, they have urged all payment services providers to implement all sorts of measures to ensure um, that, that uh, uh, a smooth processing of, of these cross-border payments. And I know that there's been a big project uh, within the bank, but of course I'm just a, a simple economist. So if you want to have any specific details on this, I have to get uh, back to you or uh, Arno as I see it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I wonder what is your advice to uh, EU growers uh, who are trading in the UK in light of the predictions that you've made? My advice to them. Well, one, one, of, the, one of the advices that I typically have, if you're, are, uh, your export is too much concentrated into one single export market, you are uh, typically very uh, skeptical to these kind of event tricks. So my advice